Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. Loue Fatui, an author and researcher in Islamic studies and comparative religion. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you, Paul. Really honored to be back on your channel. Thank you. Well, for those who don't know, uh, Dr. Fatui was born in Baghdad, Egypt, and migrated to the UK in the 90s. He has a PhD in astronomy from Durham University here in England. He originally came from a Christian family, but reverted to Islam in his early 20s. He's published over 25 books in English and Arabic in Islamic studies and published over 20 research papers in cosmology and applied historical astronomy and on the Islamic calendar. Today, Dr. Fatui has kindly agreed to discuss the historical fallacies and accuracies in the Bible and contrast them with the Quranic account. Now, his ultimate goal is not to discredit the Old Testament, but to show how, in his view, the Quranic narrative could not have been written by a human being, let alone copied from the Bible. His talk is entitled The Miraculous Quran and the Exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. So I hand over to you, sir. Thank you, Paul. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Wasfu al-Wahd wa risala wa al-Hikma wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima. Before I start, I just want to give, before we talk about the Bible and the Quran, I just want um, to highlight very important fact about the history of the Exodus, Moses, and actually other uh, major characters in the Abrahamic religions, which is the fact that there is actually no historical record uh, or artifact or archaeological find that mentions um, Ibrahim, Abraham, Musa, J Jacob, Joseph, none of them. There is no direct reference to them. Now, that obviously can be interpreted in a variety, more than uh, one way. However, what I would say before we start and go kind of through the details of these accounts in the Bible, Quran, and relate them to um, Egyptian history, um, I would like to just remind everybody that uh, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So if we uh, have, if we don't have something, it doesn't mean that thing does not exist. <clears throat> and finding and discovering ancient history uh, and what we learn about it, in particular as ancient and as Egyptian history, depends on a number of factors. One of them is to know what site we should be looking at. So when we hear the name of a city, we need to know where that city, because it would have been named um, whatever it was called at the time. So we read at, um, about that city in, let's say, in the Old Testament. Now, it's, it, where it exists exactly uh, might be a bit of a mystery for us. So there's a bit of work that some scholars do to try and identify the site. And it's not uncommon for a city mentioned in an ancient record to create a lot of differences in opinion between scholars as to where that site is. So the first difficulty is to know where the site exactly is. The second is within that kind of bigger site, where to look for any relics. So you've identified an area that this big and you said so-and-so city used to be located here. But where are you exactly going um, to dig? So you dig, the, you know, try to find um, some um, artifacts, something left from that civilization, from that city, old city. On top of that, you have actually to know how wide is that area? So how much do you expand from a center that you start with based on some assumptions that this is where we are more likely to find anything? And then if you don't find that, you go further away. And also, how deep do you dig mm -hmm. in order to get to what might be there? All of that obviously presumes that something had survived the elements and erosion. If that hadn't happened, then you might as well continue to dig as, as deep as you like. You're not going to get anywhere. Mm 
So, and there are uh, examples um, whereby scholars thought that a particular city uh, or small civilization, kingdom, uh, uh, that was mentioned in a record um, may not have existed actually to start with because there was no evidence just for evidence to turn up at some point. And then um, in the course of uh, this um, discussion, we will come across kind of close examples of what we're talking about here. Another reason that's kind of general um, a description of why it we might not find um, evidence on certain historical figures or events. To be more specific now about the Exodus, the Exodus is such a major event in the history of the Israelites. And of course, um, you know, by extension, the uh, history of all everybody who believe in the Old Testament, and that includes Christians. And as a result, uh, we Generally, people think it was such a huge event at the time. It wouldn't have been. The situation, there's a, a bit of um, kind of anachronistic thinking here. So we take a modern image that we have currently projected on the past, when the past looked very different to its people at the time. I think uh, one good comparison would be with the historical Jesus. So um, if you look at Jesus' scene, um, in the centuries following him, after um, he's gone, um, obviously he became the most important figure in history. Uh, but then, th at the time, uh, but then obviously in his time, that actually wasn't the case. He was a key profile teacher um, who didn't really uh, acquire a lot of following at the time, but things changed over time, like I said until he became the most important figure. But at some point, he became the second most important figure, um, I should add. Uh, and increasingly, he is the most, kind of the second most important, and increasingly, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the main figure in history, because that's where the direction of history is going. So, so that's another reason uh, why the Exodus uh, might not have survived uh, any records about it. Um, another important fact about it is that the Exodus, even in the eyes of those who argue it happened, it occurred, uh, consider it as a small event. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not the scale that we usually get from the Bible. We'll get to that. Mm. Because it was a small event in that little known history, then obviously it could have been lost very easily. Yeah. Now, add to that another factor, the Exodus was nothing short of a devastating defeat for the Egyptians. Why on earth would they record that? And why would they say mm. that so-and-so smaller group of people led by someone confronted us and we lost at the end? They wouldn't do that. Yeah, so just, just on that on that first point about the numbers, that that's a key issue, isn't it, for historians? The idea, the biblical account suggests something like two million human beings left Egypt, uh, obviously led by Moses uh, through the wilderness and so on to Mount Sinai and on to the Promised Land. S such numbers are simply impossible historically for all sorts of uh, basic reasons, and that's the first obvious problem with the, the alleged hist historicity of the biblical account. Um, but as, as you correctly say, if you scale that down to a much smaller group of people, the problems just disappear. And then thus you don't have um, you know, millions of people uh, walking through my, um, uh, the wilderness uh, in ways which are, are simply physically impossible to sustain, as scholars have argued. Absolutely. And, and that was really a major reason, Paul, uh, why uh, a lot of scholars rejected uh, the historicity of the event. Mm. The scale at which it's supposed to have happened is just practically impossible. Now, so what do we do then? What do scholars do with the, when they approach um, the um, Exodus? And indeed, the kind of similar events are um, uh, records uh, or history, historical events in the Bible. So there are two major approaches. One of them is which we might call minimalist approach. A minimalist approach is 
uh, is to look at the record and effectively try and put the onus of evidence on the record itself to prove that it's correct. And then you work effectively as hard as you can to dismiss the credibility of that record. So what you could end up with is effectively nothing. You start with an account in the Old Testament about a particular event, in our case, the Exodus, and you end up with absolutely nothing left. Dismiss one after another, and that's what's known usually as a minimalist approach. The opposite of that would be the maximalist approach, which is where you put the emphasis on trying to find evidence supporting um, what the ancient record says, the, um, the, New, the Old Testament. And, and in the course of doing that, it's important to realize scholars very rarely end up accepting everything literally. They don't do that, and the reason is that they are forced not to take um, the text literally, but they still manage to find supportive evidence uh, to, to say that, well, um, there is reason to believe that this record uh, was based on a genuine, real historical history. So, obviously, in our program today, we will be taking a maximalist approach, not a minimalist approach. Um, and in the course of doing that, obviously, it will be then down to the viewer to decide whether this is a strong um, case or it's a weak case. Um, different people take um, different views of that. Hmm. Um, if I start, if I may start, but just giving very, really, really kind of the, the briefest possible uh, summary of uh, the story of Moses mm. uh, in the Bible. Mm. Uh, and I'm going to just mention the main events. So uh, uh, Joseph um, is supposed to have moved to Egypt at some point um, because he was taken away to Egypt from his family. Um, the story of Joseph isn't really within what we're going to cover today because just for the sake of time, it would become a huge task. And so um, he was taken to Egypt uh, shortly afterwards. At some point, his family, all his extended family, so Jacob, um, his mother, um, that's Joseph's mother, his brothers, their family, all moved to Egypt. And scholars usually uh, locate um, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, Joseph in, in history in the Delta area that's in the north uh, of Egypt, even though it's known as Lower Egypt because the Nile obviously runs uh, south to north. And so uh, they put usually locate him here and uh, most also date um, his kind of sojourn there, stay there and the migration uh, to the days of the Hyksos. Um, this, these are uh, non-Egyptian rulers who ruled there for about over 100 years or so. Um, so he's supposed to have lived there. Uh, they are roughly uh, in the 16th century uh, or so. BCE, of course. All, everything is going to be CE today, of course. Um, so, uh, so that, uh, Joseph. Now, the story uh, of Moses in the Old Testament starts uh, by... Picking up from, um, we, we finished um, the story of uh, Joseph in, in Genesis, then Exodus, book of Exodus starts by saying that a new king is there now in power in Egypt, who didn't know anything about Joseph, and starts from there. Then we have a story of um, 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 young um, infant Moses uh, being put by his mother in a basket in the river uh, to hide him. Um, from being killed. He's picked up uh, by Pharaoh's daughter, or let's say Pharaoh's people, because in the Quran it's different. He's raised somewhere there. At some point, when he was an adult, uh, he came to, uh, the, uh, to offer help to an, um, an Israelite, one of his people, who was being attacked by an Egyptian, and he killed an Egyptian. As a result, he had to flee Egypt. So he, he escaped he went to an area called Midian, um, where he lived there uh, for a period of time. He got married there, and um, uh, he had also two sons. Then at some point, God, uh, he left Egypt, uh, sorry, Midian, and uh, God told him to leave and to go uh, back, and then uh, commissioned him basically to go to Egypt and um, tell Pharaoh 
that he needs to take the Israelites out of Egypt. And then the, obviously that developed into a confrontation um, because Pharaoh didn't like the idea. And then ultimately um, uh, the uh, Moses led after a series of uh, miracles um, that kind of forced Pharaoh to allow them to go. And then they left. Um, that's the Exodus. Um, Pharaoh regretted the decision, went after them, and then um, God told Moses uh, to part the sea so they can cross he and his followers. When the Egyptians followed them, uh, obviously the miracle didn't work for them um, because it was supposed to only save the Israelites, so they uh, drowned. Um, and that's the end of it. And that's, um, uh, that's basically the Exodus. What follows is kind of a post-Exodus history, which we aren't going to touch on uh, today, again, um, because it's uh, uh, for the sake of time. Yep. Um, now, it, what, today, uh, as you mentioned, Paul, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not interested in discrediting the Bible. There's no particular reason to do that. But the, that kind of critical assessment of the Bible will be necessary in the context of explaining why the Quran is such an unusual book, mm. such a strange book that is really very difficult to attribute to a human being, let alone the kind of human being we know Muhammad وسلم, was in the environment and the uh, settings in which, uh, in which he lived. Um, something also important to mention, the Quran, as everybody knows, is much smaller in size than the Bible. As a result, the account of Moses in the Quran is, is much briefer than the Bible. Uh, the Bible has about 4,000, over 4,300 verses on Moses in, 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 the, in book, books two to five, um, whereas the Quran has about 300 in total. Um, also, rather than have all the history uh, sequentially lined up in books as in the Bible, in the Quran, the name of Moses occurs in 34 uh, different surahs, uh, but the major uh, kind of the surahs that contain significant uh, details about him are 13 in total, and these are in different places in the Mus'haf. The written record of the Quran. Can I just point out for people who might not realize that the name of Moses is f mentioned far more frequently in the Quran than the name of Muhammad, peace be upon them both. Exactly. That's not to say that he's a lesser significant figure, but just in terms of sheer references to names, uh, Moses features much more prominently, is referred to by name much more than, than Muhammad, peace be upon them both. It is indeed, Paul. He is the, the history of Moses is the most mentioned in the uh, in most uh, detail um, than uh, any other story uh, in the Quran. And you're absolutely right. Um, the uh, mentioned far more than the references we find uh, to the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I think the other last point I need to mention is that the account in the Bible um, mentions a lot of names, places, mm. uh, people, uh, etc. Uh, in the uh, Quranic account, there are only three names uh, that we encounter. Egypt, Moses, and Aaron. Mm. Um, and, and that's all. Uh, so they aren't, and that's the nature of history, the way history is recorded uh, in, the, in the Quran. That's a different subject altogether, uh, but I just wanted to mention this. Uh, uh, when we're going to see uh, later, particularly for those who may not be familiar with the Quran, the text, Quranic text, uh, they, we need to have this in mind. The Quran is very brief, very succinct, as opposed to the detailed, verbose text of the uh, of the Bible. Well, I have um, uh, um, slides to share. Good. Uh, so we always like we always like slides. Okay. <clears throat> Very popular. Um, <clears throat> yep. I think. Here we go. 
Is it working all right? It's working perfectly. Egyptian elements in the biblical narrative. Okay, so uh, I mentioned earlier the maximalist approach. Yes. So we're going to look now at <clears throat> what reasons are there in the Old Testament account to make us think that um, the account is actually might well be based on real history. Um, and um, in doing that, we will be uh, using what might be called circumstantial evidence. Hmm. Remember, we said that there is actually no direct reference uh, to Moses, let alone the exodus in the surviving records. So, what I've done, I've, I've picked two um, uh, passages from the Bible, from the Old Testament. I give the references, by the way, always uh, mm -hmm. there so people can follow up and check uh, if they want to look at that. And if they want to check uh, different translations, the translation I use here is the, the NRSV, uh, which is kind of the standard uh, usually. Uh, but people can obviously uh, check others. So this is the first passage. Uh, Therefore, they set taskmaster masters over them, that's over the Hebrews, or the Israelites, to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pethon and Ramses for Pharaoh. And then it goes on, the Egyptians became ruthless in, in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field uh, labor. In this passage, what um, biblicists and other scholars do is to look for, is there anything in there that may suggest this is based on real history? And then this is uh, one instance. The reference to forced labor, it's well known that Egyptians used uh, forced labor. Uh, that started from the probably 18th century BCE. It was particularly uh, rife during uh, the uh, New Kingdom, um, which is from um, uh, about 1570 to around 1050, uh, and also during uh, the lifetime of uh, Ramses II, whom we will then conclude is the pharaoh. Uh, of uh, of the Exodus, uh, so if, uh, this is very um, kind of quite um, common. In fact, the Egyptians used to uh, go raid uh, uh, neighboring areas in order to pick capt captives and then turn those into uh, forced labor. This was a quite um, a common thing uh, for um, for the Egyptians. Um, there are a lot of inscriptions left, um, you know, survived, uh, that um, mention those. Uh, one of them took about 3,000 workmen uh, working on the uh, Ramesseum, which is a mortuary temple uh, that um, Ramses II built, which took 20 years to, to build, so you can understand why. And obviously 3,000 workers at the time is a huge number, but that's for just one instance of them. So that's an example of how kind of we look for circumstantial evidence to substantiate uh, the, um, the Old Testament record. The second reference is to the supply cities of Pethom and Ramses. Uh, now, these are known uh, to exist in the Delta area, the same place uh, where we said uh, Joseph originally migrated to. Pethom is, is now identified with an Egyptian city called Per Atom, uh, which is in a place called Tel al Maskota. Uh, and Ramesses is the city that is known as Per uh, This is the uh, palace of Ramesses, which Ramses II uh, built. It started before him, but he built and developed and turned it into, uh, into his capital uh, and his uh, residence as well. What's also interesting about those two cities, which we know today where they exist, is the fact that they are described as store cities or supply cities. Again, there are inscriptions about uh, Pyramses, um, Pyramses that uh, describe 
uh, this talk about uh, how much it was full of food and stuff, supplies. Uh, and the, uh, some scholars think that it was used um, um, used as supply city basically for battles. So when the army would go out uh, to battle, that's effectively, uh, logistically, it's a good idea to have th- some supplies nearby. Um, so that's, that's why um, they were built, uh, they were used as uh, supply cities. A third reference is the building uh, with mortar and brick. Uh, that's again uh, very much an um, Egyptian Egyptian uh, practice. Uh, there is a painting um, from the um, mid fifteenth century BCE that basically shows uh, workers um, kind of making uh, mud and by um, uh, mixing. Uh, water uh, with soil, um, and then basically um, making uh, the mud dry, and then creating creating the shape of bricks. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, there are references, pictorial and textual, to the uh, to this particular practice. Um, the basically building with mortar uh, and brick. It's worth noting as well here as this kind of side note. Um, Egyptians used to use stone for building temples. Uh, the rest, like palaces, uh, etc., they would usually use mortar and a brick. This is the second uh, passage. Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people as well as their supervisors. You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But you shall require of them the same quantity of bricks as they have made previously, for they are lazy. That's why they cry, quote, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. So what's in here? Right. So this is the fourth reference to use of the of task masters and supervisors to control uh, the workforce. Uh, now, while this is not mentioned in this particular passage, the task masters are, were Egyptian. The supervisors uh, 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 Israelite. So the task masters obviously would oversee the supervisors, who would themselves then make sure that uh, the enslaved Israelites did the work and worked hard. So again, uh, that is very common, uh, the use of um, uh, taskmasters uh, and supervisors at two level supervision in Egypt is also attested in, in Egyptian records. The use of straw to make bricks, this is not something that was known in Canaan. It was only known in Egypt. And um, what's, so what's interesting about, just might as well say this note here, because it's relevant to everything. Now, we all know that the Old Testament record, um, the Old Testament, including the Exodus, was written centuries after the events. Now, by then, the writers of the text would have been living in Canaan, not in, actually in Egypt. So when we find in the record clear references to Egyptian practices, then the conclusion of scholars from that is that those writers, even though writing those events by centuries, they must have been relying on surviving tradition, oral tradition, that they basically uh, transmitted from one generation to another, Admittedly, some of this would be lost, some of this would be changed, but basically it retained those Egyptian features, which is why the conclusion here is that they must have actually, it, the, the tradition must have come from real history in Egypt, as opposed to being created on the basis of what the writers knew uh, the circumstances were in Canaan when, um, when it was written. Uh, 
I think uh, just uh, just to uh, I, I agree that that interesting point. Uh, uh, some archaeologists um, and Egyptologists have dated the biblical story in Exodus to say the sixth or seventh century BC, which is long after the events um, that they purport to describe. Concluding thereby, and these are the minimalists you mentioned earlier on. Uh, therefore, th these events have no historical basis whatsoever, because uh, clearly they're written long after. How could they possibly know? And of course, as some biblical scholars have said, uh, like Richard Elliot Friedman who's a biblical scholar in America, a uh, professor there. Well, th these people are not trained in biblical scholarship, in biblical criticism. And in fact, um, just because a text, its final form may have been, say, you know, just after the Exodus or before the Exodus, a much later date, doesn't mean they didn't use sources. The sources themselves could predate that that uh, later time by many, many centuries. And we have examples of this in, in many areas of the Bible. And so we can test these sources to see how historical they are. And indeed, they, they, they have concluded, at least uh, people like Professor Freeman have, that there are telltale signs, linguistic signs, like names of cities or names of individuals and, and other indications that we are dealing here with very early tradition that goes back to uh, a memory of an experience in Egypt itself. So a later dating that, that, that the minimalists sometimes propose really, so the argument would go, uh, betrays a, a lack of understanding of biblical criticism and how we interrogate texts and understand the traditions and sources that they have used and in, interrogate those sources for historical authenticity and reliability or otherwise, of course. Absolutely. And uh, Paul, what you find as well, inconsistency in the way different records, historical records are approached. So the Old Testament is a historical record. It's an ancient document. Forget about its religious significance and all. It's an ancient document. And it's quite interesting to see how, uh, you know, this attitude, the pick and choose attitude, uh, cherry picking, uh, that's quite rife when it comes to those um, situations and analyses. And often what happens is that, um, we're all obviously driven by some kind of biases. Let's call them assumptions. But if you don't declare them up front and say, that is where I'm starting from, my starting point, the analysis would be effectively misleading because you're right and you have the right to say, oh, that's my belief. That's what I think might have happened. But by um, setting this kind of at the beginning and making it clear, it becomes easier for the reader, for the uh, listener to understand where you're coming from. But if you don't do that, and then present it as if this is the truth and only truth, and you just complete yeah. another uh, truth seeker, you end up actually misleading uh, your um, audience. And, and, you've, so and you've made it very clear that your position is more akin to the maximalist position. And indeed, you're right. These are the standard terms used in Old Testament scholarship, the minimalist and the maximalist. And so you can you can map people. And some, some people are in the middle. Not everyone's in either extreme. So, some are kind of more in the middle. They're not too maximalist or minimalist. But you're on the maximalist. You start from that assumption, which is a perfectly mainstream assumption. Uh, so to, to produce... Uh, a, a more favourable, perhaps, view of the historicity issues, and that, that's fine if you can back it up. And as you as you are proceeding to do, that's a perfectly valid methodology, I think. Absolutely, absolutely, and and also um, to add to that, um, having or declaring biases. Um, is not a kind of a weakness uh, because we all right. have biases. Those who claim don't have biases, well, they need to live and study human beings. A, a little bit more. Mm. We can't live without those bad, bad Very true, very true. Sorry to interrupt. Thank That's you. That's all right. Thank you very much for your contribution, Paul. Really appreciate it. Okay, so um, back to the text. Yes. Okay, so where, where did we get that? Okay, so number six. Number six is talking about um, how um, the Egyptians were required um, or um, required of the, their slaves, uh, the Israelites, to produce the same uh, quantity that was given to them, even though they are now required to do extra work. So they have to gather uh, this straw for themselves rather than given this straw by someone else. And what's important about this, it introduces the concept of quota. So again, uh, we have uh, records from uh, the, from there, from that particular period, uh, talking, for instance, about one um, uh, supervisor writing uh, to his, um, if you like, superior, 
um, proudly about how his work, workers had met their quota, which is exactly what we have here. And then we have uh, this reference to Moses, um, repeatedly, obviously, it will happen later in the text, uh, asking uh, the uh, Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. Uh, what's, what's interesting about that? Well, um, we know that uh, the Egyptians control their borders and they wouldn't allow anybody to go out or in. Uh, they, have, they had um, border guards. Um, and we have really particularly interesting uh, record from uh, Peramses itself, where somebody is reporting how slaves, I think three of them, escaped from there and how they were chased. And there was like a report. Somebody is actually issuing a report about uh, those escapees. And this is kind of, um, and they were, um, like I said, chased. So this scenario, obviously on, on a much smaller scale, is be- very reminiscent of the Exodus and, and what Moses um, mm. was, was asking for. Yeah. Finally, this is also a reference to, uh, that can be kind of, um, can be related to something we know from ancient Egypt. So Egyptians used to have um, kind of holidays, days off, to go and offer sacrifices to their gods. So this is, again, a reference to practice that the Egyptians um, were familiar with. Now, it, it's, you know, um, we, I think we can presume that Moses, according to the Bible, was using this as a bit of a um, pretext um, because the Israelites were not going to come back. But the idea here is that um, he was trying to convince Pharaoh that in the same way that other people go out to worship their gods, take a day off or so, then we would also like to be allowed to take uh, time off to worship our gods. And I think in one instance, talking about three days or something. Um, before I get to that, actually, I must mention, I think you mentioned it, Paul. There are other kind of pieces of evidence I, I haven't really, um, uh, I don't want to go through because it becomes a bit too technical. And it's of the same kind of nature. For instance, the text um, of the, uh, uh, of Exodus uh, uses a lot of Egyptian loan words. So these are words that would have come from Egypt. Um, again, the writers writing later, centuries later, uh, wouldn't have used these words if they were not relying on surviving tradition. Um, and the, the percentage of these loan words, it's much higher from Egypt than you find in any other text that isn't supposed to have been based on uh, events in ancient Egypt. There are also Egyptian names there in the text. So that kind of evidence that is uh, also circumstantial evidence that used by scholars. Are we okay, Paul, to move to the next slide? You all right? Yes, um, I just wanted to, uh, I'm not sure if it's the right find or not, I just wanted to just mention um, this book by uh, Professor uh, Richard Elliott Freeman. It's called The Exodus, um, uh, How It Happened and Why It Matters. Now, this is just not any old scholar. This is, uh, he's one of America's uh, leading uh, biblical scholars. Uh, he's also um, an archaeologist. He's uh, uh, taught at Oxford and Cambridge and so on. And um, he's written this book in defense of the historicity of the Exodus. I just wanted to, if you don't mind, just read a short paragraph Absolutely. from a smaller Exodus. This is what he argues. He argues actually it happened. He says the principal points that people generally bring up in doubting the Exodus, he said, are mostly about numbers. Um, this is on page 27. We have found no remnant of the two million people in the Sinai reading. The Bible alludes to two million human beings. We have found no widespread material culture in Egypt of early Israel, no Egyptian style pottery or architecture. We have found no records in Egypt of a huge mass of Israelite slaves or of a huge exodus. True, he says, but... None of this is evidence about whether the Exodus happened or not. It is evidence only of whether it was big or not. For heaven's sake, he says, did we need archaeological work to confirm that an Exodus of two million people was, shall we say, problematic? 
And then he says, it has already been calculated long ago that if the people were marching, say, eight across, then when the first ones got to Mount Sinai, half of the people were still in Egypt. And I think it was Bishop Colenso who calculated around 150 years ago, and this is interesting, he calculated 150 years ago that the, that the amount of, let us say, delicately residue that the many people would have deposited in the Sinai over a period of 40 years, and, and he figured that the Sinai wilderness should be fertile. It would have been in blossom as a result. Do we really need archaeologists combing the Sinai and not finding anything to prove what we knew or anyway, the absence of, of the exodus and wilderness artifacts questions only whether there, there was a massive exodus. The scale I won't go on. I mean, this is a, a great, but very, for popular audience, very readable, but it's based on cutting edge research that was done at, at a conference in the United States with world's leading experts from the United States and Israel, archaeologists, biblical scholars, Egyptologists and others. And uh, a lot of the issues came that came out of that conference are recorded or discussed, at least in this uh, book, which has been critically reviewed by other scholars uh, in very positive terms by scholars. I mean, professors of archaeology uh, and other distinguished academics. So this is not a, a one off. This is a serious uh, attempt to restate the historicity of the biblical narrative, but in a modified moderate moderated form not simply copying what the bible on the surface says that i'm afraid doesn't appear to hold water we can't really go with that anyway so it's one yeah. to paul you're absolutely uh, spot on here and what's really uh, kind of telling is that um this approach of taking a biblical text mm. a biblical narrative and then scaling it down or mm. adapting it uh, to um, refer to a particular event uh, that scholars consider to be historical is a quite um, common practice. So why exclude the Exodus? So it's actually it's the whole, it, the same applies to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So scholars do that all the time. Yeah. For whatever reason, when it comes to certain events, they are just they don't apply the same methodology, which is what they do. And Back to the scale, you're absolutely right about it. It's quite funny. I mean, um, if, if there were about 3 million or so, which is basically what the figures um, tell us, those who left, uh, we'll get to that, but just might as well comment about the stats. You mentioned that. If they walked 10 abreast, the length uh, of, of this whole column of migrants would be 300 kilometers. Now, at its widest, uh, Sinai is 210, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. So they would, I mean, just think about it. And how, we, so there are all kinds, obviously, of uh, problems there, but you're absolutely right. That doesn't tell us anything about um, the historicity of the Exodus in the same way that if Jesus did not have 5,000 audience in the audience, for instance, witnessing a miracle, does not need does not mean that he did not have any audience or he never actually existed or he never made um any uh, performed any miracle that's just same thing isn't it yeah fair enough okay uh, so um the title um kind of gives an idea about what's um we're going to talk about here um where the israelites large or small in numbers. And the, the Bible is, is contradictory here, it contradicts itself, because on the one hand, it talks about uh, population controlled by slavery. So if I um, quote here from Exodus 112, the more they were, they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So it didn't work, but they were basically uh, trying to use the slavery uh, to control the population. Now, one of the problem with that is that the, 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 the one of the problem is the Israelites were already slaves. Mm. So it's not like they were free people; they were already slaves. Second, um, how do you control the population by enslaving them? I mean, what what would that exactly achieve? How how would that work? Also, uh, the Egyptians used to, as we mentioned earlier. Um, go out looking for slaves. So they will actually raid neighboring areas to bring back slaves. 
And the last pharaoh who would have wanted to reduce the number of slaves would have been Ramses II, because he built more than anyone else and uh, wanted as many slaves as possible. Now, uh, again, an important point to make here is that slavery wasn't specific uh, to the Israelites. Um, if you read the Old Testament, because of its ethnocentric nature, you think that it's only the Israelites who are their slaves or everything seems to be about them. It wasn't actually. Um, other uh, people, uh, other peoples uh, were also enslaved. Um, captives were brought from a variety from Libya, for instance, Libyans from neighboring countries or other places, and they were enslaved as well. So it wasn't only uh, about them. Now, um, as I mentioned, it didn't work. Uh, the population could not be controlled by slavery. So um, now Pharaoh moved to, the, to a second strategy, and now he's trying to kill them, um, kill some of them anyway. And again, the problem you have here is what I listed earlier. Do you want to reduce the number of slaves, etc.? It doesn't seem to be logical to me. Also, it is not mentioned in the Quran. So the Quran does not talk about uh, murdering the Israelites to control their population. What it talks about is at the time of Moses' birth, clearly there was an attempt to kill infants, newborns. But that is usually interpreted as uh, Pharaoh was aware somehow of the um, kind of imminent birth of a leader that who would be a threat to him. You find this explanation in, um, in, in exegesis, exegetical works, but also somebody like Josephus also mm. uh, mentioned that in uh, Jewish antiquities. Uh, so this is well known, uh, but um, it wasn't, that's not um, in the Quran. It's not a way of controlling uh, population. And then um, this is where kind of, it becomes kind of a bit um, more of a comical in some way, uh, the account. So what we're told here is that the Hebrews had two midwives. Now, if they had two midwives, surely the population must have been very, very small. And you don't want to control uh, that population. Um, so there is no kind of, we immediately run into difficulties there. And then obviously the whole narrative about this midwives thing, it, it just does, it doesn't have any credibility really. I mean, the Pharaoh is supposed to have gone to them and told them, when you go and help um, pregnant um, Israelite women um, give birth, kill the newborn if it was a male, mm -hmm. but let it live if it was a female. Now, let's imagine what would have happened. They said they would have gone, let's say they uh, wanted to put uh, to follow what the instructions. So what they've gone to, the first time they were called upon, one of them would have gone to family X um, and then help um, the pregnant uh, woman to give birth. And then it turned out to be a male. So she killed it right in the middle of the family. And then would you expect next time a woman to be in labor, to call on that midwife and tell her, come and help me. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Nor this whole atmosphere is just not quite real. And then uh, the text says they did not agree. The midwives didn't want to follow uh, the brutal instructions um, of Pharaoh. Uh, they had called on them and told them, why did you not do what I asked you to do? And then they come up with an equally kind of um, humorous reply, really, uh, to tell them that, oh, uh, because the Egyptian women are vigorous, and by the time the midwife gets to the pregnant woman, she would have given birth. So here we go. So there's actually no point in having midwives to start with. And the problem is that Pharaoh believed all of that. Well, Pharaoh, this particular Pharaoh, uh, who was such a um, brilliant a military leader, builder, etc., seems to have bought completely into uh, kind of this story. Now, the other reference that creates a problem for the suggestion that the Israelites were numerous is that um, Jacob's extended family, when they moved to Egypt, which was about, let's say, 400 years roughly uh, before the time of Moses, they were, the Bible tells us, that there were 70 in total. 
Now, 70 in total in 400 years is impossible mm. uh, to become uh, numerous, let alone the big numbers we're going to see later. Uh, it's just not possible. So again, this is, so you can see, um, it's a, I mean, what would you do with a text like this? You have two options, either to say, I'm going to dismiss it all, or you can rightly say, well, there's contradiction between the two. So if one of them is historical, then surely whichever sounds more realistic is likely to be historical. And then the Bible also uh, talks about uh, four uh, the Egyptian, the Israelites staying for four generations uh, in Egypt. So, at some point, God tells uh, Abraham, "They shall come back here in the fourth generation." So he's talking to him in Canaan. So um, the, his descendants will go and live in Egypt and then come back after uh, four generations. And this. This, you know, the reference is clear. Scholars have struggled with that, and they tried to come up with interpretations for generation, for being anything other than what we know a generation to mean, and struggled with that. Uh, but it, it's definitely um, a contradiction. The other thing is that this is actually the genealogy of Moses as given in the Bible. Now, if you look at it, he's actually fourth generation of Jacob, not of Abraham. It's a minor point. It doesn't matter really whether it's four or six generation. Um, you might go for 60 generations and you still have tro trouble there reconciling uh, all, the, all the narratives. Um, also, we have other references, for instance, in um, uh, Deuteronomy, where it talks about the Israelites being a smaller nation than other nations in Canaan suggesting they were small. Also, uh, we know that they uh, did not want to fight other nations because those other nations were stronger than them after they left Egypt. So all these kind of suggest they were actually small group rather than the big group, uh, we're told. Next, how long did they stay in Egypt? So, again, this is... Um, um, uh, God addressing Abraham, your offspring shall be aliens in a land that is not theirs and shall be slaves there, and they shall be oppressed for 400 years. The number is clear, um, and again, no reason to doubt it. So that's talking, obviously, from the time uh, Joseph went to Egypt to the time uh, of the Exodus. That's what it's, it's referring to. So look at the second uh, passage, the time that the Israelites had lived in Egypt was 400. This is a post Exodus, by the way, this text. The time that the Israelites had lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the companies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. The importance or significance of this text is it's, it's how specific it is. So if somebody says 400 years were not meant to be 400 years in the earlier text, well, this clarifies it and makes it more precise. It's 430. And if that's not sufficient, well, it's to the very day. How this was counted, I have no idea. But the point here is that it was a huge, a long period of around, let's say, 400 years. But then the... Bible, the Old Testament becomes even more specific, and it goes to say about the Exodus, the Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, where about 600,000 men on foot mm. beside little ones. Yeah. That is a huge number. And um, again, repeated elsewhere, the people I am with. This is Moses now talking to God after they've left Egypt, telling him that I'm with number 600,000. Again, uh, as we saw earlier, there's yet another passage that makes this kind of rough number even more specific. From 20 years old and up, everyone able to go to war in Israel, all those enrolled were 603,000. 550. So you see the numbers we're talking about here. 
Um, and what these kind of add up to is around 3 million. Um, now, the thing is, the Israelites actually did not leave alone. So just, to clarify, just to clarify, you round up. So how do you round it up to 3 million? You've jumped from 600. So how do you make that? Um, okay, so, so you're talking here, those all only men uh, on foot. Mm -hmm. um, and in this particular case, uh, we're talking only those who are able to go to war. So there's yeah. adults. So you add to these women, women, their wives, those who are married. You could double that. You at least double that figure at the very least, because right. obviously that's just the men. So you double that to get the women, assuming they were monogamous. Right. Which is a now, monogamous. And if you, if you remember that the whole atmosphere, the whole setting is that one of exploding population, you, know, you expect every family to have right. at least to children. Right. And if you put this together, you're actually jumping into even a higher figure. Okay. That, not counting, Paul, the other people who went out with, with the Israelites, because mm -hmm. we are taught that a mixed crowds, so other people left with them. Oh. And then obviously, uh, apparently they took away um, with them their livestock. Right. And now, when we counted the length of the column of immigrants, we didn't count animals there. No. Um, but that would make it even more, obviously. Wow. And okay, so we're dealing with a vast, vast number, much more than just 600,000. We're dealing with, uh, as you say, millions in effect. We have to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. Okay, so... Now, uh, there has been uh, some attempts to try and make kind of sense of this um, one suggestion is that the Israelites were particularly um, 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 uh, fertile um, but then the problem is at the time um, the average age was about 19 I mean people would live to 30 average life expectancy for a male about 30 female 34 but because of the um, uh, high, high rate of early death the average is 19 also, the whole population of Egypt was kind of estimated to be around um, 3,500 to 5 or something like that. So it's just not, not really realistic. And that, as you rightly mentioned, uh, Paul, has been used as a major point against the historicity of the Exodus, rather than modify the kind of text as we do with other texts, and make them more realistic and relate them to historical events we know, and there's evidence pointing to. Um, scholars, some scholars have rejected um, the story, the whole story, uh, because uh, of that issue. So the solution, as you rightly mentioned, Paul, is that an exodus did happen, but it was on a much smaller scale. And as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't really the huge event in, in world history, if you like that it later became. Uh, so we should actually look at it for what it was at the time, not what it became centuries afterwards. Now we're going to start uh, uh, with the Quranic text. Mm. So let's see what the Quran says here. Small, disorganized remnants. Let me explain what that, where that comes from. So, when um, the Israelites left, at some point the Quran tells us that Pharaoh urged his people to go after the escapees. And in the course of ur urging them to go and encouraging them to do that, he made this claim. He described them as shirdhimatun qalilun. Shirdhimatun qalilun. And um, there's no really any kind of disagreement about what these two words meant. Qalilun is just threatful, it's small, small in number. Um, so that's what Qalilun is. Um, Shirdhana, um, it has two related meanings. One of them is disorganized, chaotic. Uh, and the other is, this gives the sense of remnants, something that was what left over from a bigger group. So that's a sherdama. So in Arabic, when you use the verb as well, you share them as you, that means you farrakh, to separate, to divide, uh, reduce a number, 
uh, move from organized to disorganized. And, and this description of the Quran basically deals with one major obstacle that historians have had with the biblical account. Um, the, the, the Quran is clear that the Israelites were small in number and they were a disorganized a remnant. Now, why is remnant? Why is the use of that word? So can, can I just, before you go, I, I just want to just share, if I may, uh, one of my favorite translations of the uh, Quran by Professor Abdul uh, Halim of this uh, very verse. Um, verse 52, then we revealed our will to Moses, leave with my servants by night, for you will be pursued. Pharaoh sent messages into the cities proclaiming these people, and these are Israelites who, according to the biblical account, are literally have to be millions, two, three million. These people, according to the Quran, are a puny band. They have enraged us and we are a large army on the alert. So the Quran is very, in this English translation, they were puny band. There were few in numbers, um, which is exactly what you're saying. And, um, and is actually interesting, precisely the thesis of this um, uh, author, who is a top biblical scholar and archaeologist, is Jewish himself, but he recognizes the, the point. And the Quran seems to uh, have anticipated uh, the answer to this question. That you're raising yes you're absolutely right Paul. so now why why are they uh, remnants why this sense in the word of shirdana uh, because at some point uh, the quran talks about um the israelites mm. uh, being harmed by Pharaoh after Moses came to them. So at some point, they argue, the Israelites argue with Moses. They say something along the lines, we were harmed before you came to us and after you came to us. And in another verse, uh, we read in the Quran how um, as a result of Moses' confrontation with Pharaoh, uh, the chiefs of Pharaoh uh, were telling him, well, let's kill them or let's kill some of them. So there's clearly, there's an, some, um, um, some um, not massacre, but they were being attacked. Some of them were being killed, etc. So there's an, an element uh, of that um, um, kind of reducing their number as, as a, a form of revenge, not to reduce their number because they were, uh, a lot. The, in the Quran, it was reactive to what Moses was doing. That's the only reason um, they were attacked. As a result of this, if we think that the uh, those who left with Moses were a small group, then we should also expect that um, the Pharaoh didn't need to lead a huge army um, it could have been much smaller than he would have done in other uh, battles. I mean, in, in, in the Battle of, of Kaddish, uh, he led uh, 20,000, um, uh, army of 20,000. He could have um, had a smaller army. Obviously, this speculation, just on the basis of him uh, uh, recognizing they were a smaller number. So he might have gone after them with a smaller um, number. Uh, than, than the Bible would probably um, would suggest. Um, now, I want to read out an, uh, a verse, translation of a verse. And I want to mention, by the way, um, when I translate a verse, it's, it's my own translation, which may be similar uh, to other translation, may be slightly different, but that's my own translation, simply because it's a translation is an interpretation, so I prefer to do mine. Of course. So, and um, one verse, which is verse Yunus, uh, that's um, chapter 10, uh, verse 83. Um, it says, uh, but no one believed in Moses except youths among his, among his people for fear of Pharaoh and their chiefs that would uh, persecute them. So what that suggests to me is that when the Israelites left, again, contrary to what the Bible suggests, because it has this interest in retaining the wholeness of the nation, of the nation, which actually extends throughout 
than the Bible as a theme, including the return from Babylon and how they will come together again. This kind of preservation of the wholeness um, of the chosen people of God. This verse suggests to me that not everybody left with Moses. Some people did not believe in him. Some people rejected his message because, or they didn't want to live with him because they were afraid of Pharaoh. And it would be unrealistic to think that people just completely bought into his message, every one of them, every single one of them, because this is something that has never, ever happened to anybody in history, whether uh, the a preacher was a religious or non-religious political leader, um, whatever kind of leader, nobody can achieve, nobody achieved that. So we can presume safely that only a portion of the Israelites left with them. Add to that, when the Egyptians enslaved people and used them um, as forced labor, they did not honor where they lived. They were not keen on leaving them in a particular place, so they lived with their families and extended family and relatives and all of that. No, they didn't do that. The, what they were more keen about is to deploy them with wherever they needed them. So you had people building in, in Thebes and in Egypt and in the north in uh, Paramses, for instance, and these are uh, hundreds of kilom kilometers away. And we know from survival records when uh, the Egyptians needed to deploy uh, servants, uh, sorry, slaves, uh, workmen, they did that. So there's every possibility that some of the Egyptians, uh, of the Israelites, were actually living elsewhere. Mm. They didn't make it or they, did, they didn't want to make it. We can't obviously this all speculation, but it, it sounds completely realistic and reasonable uh, to expect that ultimately those who left with Moses were actually only um, and some of the Israelites who were living in Egypt. And I go back to this important point about this kind of wholeness, the integrity uh, of the Israelites, that is a major theme. It's not actually kind of difficult to kind of substantiate, um, um, you know, realistically um, that this is the case. Now, what's interesting as well here is why would the Quran say that about the Israelites? Why would it not go with the large scale event? It would sound more sensational mm. uh, from this storytelling point of view. It's definitely much better sounding. Um, it creates a lot more excitement. Remember, I'm using imageries and terms that reflect human emotions and reactions. And that's important to contrast that with the language of the Quran. The language and even the level of details here. So, for instance, to give an example, related example, the, uh, after giving such a detailed account in a few surahs, chapters, of the story of Moses building up towards ultimately uh, the exodus and the uh, death of Pharaoh and his um, uh, soldiers, the Quran doesn't dwell on that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop there. And then goes into all kinds of details, telling us how they died, gloating over everything there and giving us pages and pages of that. No, it just given in a, I call it kind of, cold description of facts, if you like. That is what's focused on. Now, that way of um, recounting history still creates a lot of reaction in somebody who becomes engaged with that text. But at the factual level, it remains quite precise and accurate mm -hmm. and doesn't seek, like I say, some kind of sens sensationalization of the event. And, and it's interesting, you see in the, in the Christian Bible, you see examples of this increased sensationalization. For example, in the Gospels, as as now dated by biblical scholars, the earliest is Mark, for example, where you have descriptions of miracles. Jesus heals a man uh, who's uh, you know born blind or he has possessed by demons and so on. If you look at the same story in Matthew, for example, who is now understood to have used Mark completely to gobble up Mark, edited it, 
uh, embellished it and added his own material. If you see exactly the same stories and the same wording from Mark that he copies, he occasionally, and this is a known, this is a known motif, this is a known phenomenon by scholars, he occasionally doubles the miracles. So you have two men born blind or two men um, possessed by devils. Uh, and, and so you see this process of amplification and embellishment to glorify Jesus, uh, to, to exaggerate. And you get this in the in the uh, the events surrounding the empty tomb, where you have one person, then you have two angels, and then you, the later you go, you have more miraculous. In, in Matthew, you have a you have the earthquake, and you have all these supernatural occurrences which had never uh, been narrated before. So you, uh, you see this increased process of the glorification, the grandizement, the mythologicalization, the embellishment of the same story as it goes through time, and and arguably then the Exodus story, which was originally of, on a smaller scale, uh, became in the myth of origins of this later writer about the Israelites' history coming out of Egypt. Uh, perhaps the desire to uh, just add some bulk to it, add a few deeds, add a few noughts to the numbers, you know, <laughs> uh, because it's more impressive, you know, um, and, you know, why not, you know, but you can, you can actually rewind the clock and go back to the earlier stories like you can with the Gospels. And you can see how things were exaggerated. Not that there weren't any, but there were miracles in the early, in the key stories, but they were multiplied and exaggerated and details and elements of supernatural touches were added to it. And I think we see that arguably in the biblical narrative of the Exodus, as you're describing it. Absolutely. Paul. And, and, the, and the Quran, of course, uh, is not succumbing to that uh, narrative. It's not, it's not following that trend. It's actually... Um, is actually giving a more perhaps sober, more realistic, perhaps a historically plausible account than the later embellished account we see in the biblical narratives, which have been rejected wholesale by the vast majority of scholars. Virtually all of them reject it as it stands. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, even conservative Christians, Jews, uh, try to find a way of modifying the obvious meaning of certain terms Mm. Members, etc., to just make it more acceptable. And um, so, in this, in this kind of, um, along the same lines, we're talking here, Paul. And um, in the Quran, the Quran has history in it, but not a lot of history. It doesn't have a storytelling. Mm. I mean by that, I'm using this term to refer the way human beings recount, right. tell stories. It doesn't do that. No. It has its own way of presenting history. It's actually a very kind of subject. We might just talk about this some other point, uh, but it's 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 it just has its own unique mm. characteristic, characteristic way uh, of recounting history. Yeah. Building on that point, uh, Paul, the what's what's really interesting if you compare the Quranic account, the very brief account, the two word history account that we just talked about, mm. two word history, better than or more accurate than many page, several page history that you find in the Bible. Now, if you look at what the exegetical works, what exegetes have done, you're back to the world of human beings. So what you find there is that Shardimatun Qalilun is used in the commentary, obviously, so they make a comment explaining what happened, but what they use in the details the same details that you find in the Old Testament. Mm. So we're back here to 600,000. Even the two midwives um, are mentioned there in this context. And those kind of very clever, obviously, um, commentators somehow try to reconcile these two. And what's happening here is that um, kind of um, inclination that we have to have a story and to have a sensational story, a detailed story. The, a lot of what we call Israelites and Israeliyat um, in Hadith and other narratives are really influenced by that need to know more. Mm. The Quran is tantalizing, mm. gives us that bit and only that bit, but it doesn't tell us more. Now, there is nothing wrong with then trying to find further you know, details, more details from other sources, nothing wrong with that. We need to recognize, though, the limits of the Quranic text and the nature of the extra texts we're adding, we're quoting, and what we're doing in the course of doing that. Because 
if you say um, that 600,000 is okay, well, it isn't. It isn't. Let me give you an example. Uh, from the kind of settings, societal settings, that those very commentators were uh, very aware of, uh, when uh, the... Uh, in the first battle of Dal the uh, number of fighters, Muslim fighters, were around 313, so over th just over 300. That's the number we're talking about. When the Muslim army uh, in the eighth uh, year uh, uh, conquered Mecca peacefully, they were in the region of 10 to 12,000. Now, that is what we're talking about. So uh, these exegetes are aware of what 600,000 would mean, only men mm. would mean. But what's, what it tells us, because for me, it adds another kind of dimension, another kind of adds more emphasis on how strange a unique and non-human sounding the Quran is. Mm. It doesn't fall into that trap. Mm. Exegetes who believe in the Qur'an, still fell in the trap of the Old Testament uh, text. Mm. Back to the slides. Okay, now this is something that is probably known to mm. most viewers, but I thought it's such an important thing that it I is. should still mention it. As you can see here, we have three different eras um, represented by the uh, prophet who lived in that era, Abraham. The dates are not exact, by the way. So Abraham could have, been, could have lived in the 22nd century BCE, but I've just put a rough figure there. And Joseph, roughly 17th, um, and Moses in the 13th, as we will see later. Now, the title of the Egyptian monarch uh, mentioned in the Old Testament and the Bible differ because it's called Pharaoh in the Bible in the time of Abraham and then becomes king or Pharaoh, or Pharaoh alternate, you know, they alternate before the two, between the two in the Bible. In the Quran, it's king, Abraham, king at the time of Joseph, it becomes also only Pharaoh at the time of Moses. Now, the interesting thing here is that the title Pharaoh is old, means the great house, and it, it referred to the monarchy, uh, but not as a title for the monarch himself. That was first used for Thotmos III in the 15th century. Now, what you see here, this separation is between uh, the two earlier uh, prophet and the third prophet, the post Totmos, the third prophet, which is Moses. Now, the Quran differentiates between um, the title used in the first two and the third. So, in the first two, the, the, the monarch is called king, and this uh, lived before Pharaoh was used as a title uh, for uh, the monarch, whereas the Bible is confused about that. It uses Pharaoh earlier at the time of Abraham when there was no Pharaoh. It wasn't used as a title. And then it alternates uh, between uh, king and, um, uh, and Pharaoh. And uh, the, 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 the issue here, obviously, is to note again the same kind of um, argument. Why would the Quran do that? If the Quran was just copying, from the Bible, as many believe it did, because if they say it didn't, and that's that's really important, you have no option then other to say it must have gone come from somewhere else, and somewhere else would have been the claim the Quran makes, which is a revelation from God, as I used to call it, and I like to call it direct access to history. So basically, it, it doesn't need a medium. So it comes straight from there. So, but the, the question for those who think it's it's a copy, why would the Quran do that? Now, if it would do that, how it would kind of maintain this consistency? Now, remember, we spoke um, last time uh, uh, on another program on the difference between Quran and Mus'haf, Quran being the revelation, Mus'haf is the record of that revelation. Now, even if you say the 
Quran uh, use this consistency and what's historically accurate uh, titles uh, for the monarchs, if the process of putting together, writing down the um, revelation was haphazard, messy, as some and a lot of Western scholars claim, well, how did this not mess up, for instance, this particular use of um, uh, of, of the of the of the title, I, I, think, kind of I, I just to add, add to this. Sorry, you, you make, I think you make a, You could say this was kind of. Uh, it's possible to argue, I suppose. It's not my view, but you could argue this is just a fluke. The uh, the Quran happens to get it right. Uh, it's not anachronistic. It doesn't use language of the the, the of the head of state. Uh, if I call him that, that that it is uh, it belongs to a later era. Uh, and he gets it accurate. But actually, there are other examples, and we can't go into this now, being picked up by Western scholars, like Andrew Newworth, who noticed that the, the Quranic word uh, for the actual followers of Jesus um, in the Quran is, is actually historically accurate and would not be expected of a 7th century Arab to understand that nuanced difference. And I'm not going to get into that issue now, but it's been noticed in uh, the height of Western scholarship as something truly remarkable that the Quran has a very precision, precise way of describing things that gets it just right with a certain accuracy of detail you would not expect from, you certainly, you never expect it. And for someone to get it consistently right, whether it be the, 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 the word used to describe Jesus' disciples, which is not the way they were described in the seventh century anywhere in the ancient Near East, in the Christian world or in the Arabic world, and to get it right again when it comes to describing Pharaoh or the king, um, a couple of thousand years before that, uh, it, it, there's a two instances that I'm aware of, which are which raise eyebrows even in Western scholarly circles, thinking, "Wow, this is remarkable." Uh, of course, they don't jump to the conclusion that it's supernatural because their methodology, as historical critical scholars, prohibits them. It's interesting. The worldview actually uh, makes it haram, if you like, to uh, consider God. Quite bizarrely, but that's a, a, a facet of Western scholarship that is an issue. Uh, Muslims are not constrained by this uh, philosophical prejudice and can freely acknowledge, if the evidence warrants it, that maybe there is a divine uh, um, revelation here. They are free to do that. Western scholars are not. They're prohibited from doing that. Uh, I mean, they really are prohibited. If you if you said that in an academic setting in the West, you'd probably destroy your career. But Muslims are not prohib uh, pro uh, prohibited from doing that at all. So they can acknowledge God's action or God's word when, it, when there's good evidence to see that it's there. And these are perhaps two rather good examples of that. Uh, very unexpected, I, I would say. Absolutely, absolutely, Paul. Absolutely, absolutely spot on. Okay. Now... We're going to move to something quite different and quite unique to the Quran again, um, which is: <clears throat> Do we did were there two pharaohs involved with Moses or one? Um, this is a major difference between the uh, account in the Bible uh, and in the Quran. In the Bible, uh, we have two. Um, let me give an example here, probably. Um, so this is one passage uh, from the Bible. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. That was made when Moses was in Midian. So he would have um, lived at the time of the what they call him the oppression pharaoh. So then we have a new pharaoh who will be called the Exodus pharaoh. So the story here in the Bible, contains clearly uh, two pharaohs. And then they've got another mention here where God is talking to Moses, go back to Egypt for all those who were seeking your life uh, are dead. Now, if you contrast this with what the Quran says, we recite to you from the story of Moses and Pharaoh in truth, for uh, people who believe. So it starts from there and then goes on all the way to say, we took him and his soldiers and cast them into the sea. Now, this runs from verse 3 to 40. And the reason I'm citing the beginning and the end is to show that it covers the whole story of Moses. It talks about one Pharaoh. There is no reference to a second Pharaoh anywhere. But that's not the only place 
we, where we can conclude that. Look at this second passage. The, Moses was commissioned to go to Pharaoh uh, by God. And then this is him talking to God and say, and they, that's the Egyptians, have a crime against me because he's killed um, an Egyptian. So I fear that they will kill me. Allah replies, no, go both of you with our signs. Indeed, we are all with you listening. So he didn't tell him, as in the Bible, oh, the Pharaoh whom you are afraid of had died. No, there's absolutely no mention of that. And then we have a third passage where it goes, after he went to Pharaoh, Moses, now it's Pharaoh who's arguing and challenging Moses. Did we not raise you as a child among, among us, among us, and you lived with us for years of your life, and you did your deed, which you did, being of the ungrateful, one of the ungrateful. So again, uh, all the three passages and the whole context suggest and clearly talk about one Pharaoh. And this, it becomes particularly clear when you compare um, kind of equivalent accounts in the Bible uh, and uh, in the Quran. And what's interesting here is that um, when, so all the scholars, Muslim exegetes, always believe there's one Pharaoh, because that's what the text is clear talking about. But when it comes to modern scholars who try to consider uh, what we know about ancient Egypt now, you start seeing them moving in the direction of talking there were two pharaohs. Because whether their concern becomes broader than simply focusing on the Quranic text, they're trying to say, well, what account that we can kind of make work better uh, for kind of historical account would fit more uh, what the Quran and the Bible say. And in doing that, they're clearly influenced by what the Old Testament says there. So for instance, uh, there's um, um, a, a, a scholar called Tom um, uh, Bukai, Maurice Bukai, French, who published a very famous book, became really famous um, in the Islamic world in the late uh, 70s, uh, called uh, the Bible, uh, the Quran, and modern science. Yes. And that's one of the things he talks about. And you can see he talks about two pharaohs. Uh, another one is uh, the famous uh, Abdul Wahab al Najjar, who wrote a very famous book called Qusas al Anbiya, the stories of prophets. And he does exactly the same because, again, he's exposed uh, to information about ancient Egypt and the way uh, they're trying to make sense of it. And then that they end up effectively presuming uh, that there were two pharaohs, even though they can't point anywhere in the Quran to that particular concept. And in fact, if you read this, the accounts and the way it's, it's, it's told, uh, you can tell right away that there's only one. If you look in particular at, at the first paragraph, uh, first passage from the Quran, now this is the story starting from beginning to end. There is no point at which, and it would have happened if the Pharaoh we're talking about died, it would have been mentioned because it would have been significant, but there's, there's no mention of that. Now, why is that important? Uh, because we're interested in history. Because the Quran must be talking about a long reigning Pharaoh. Now, I would like to mention here that the, as I said, the, 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 the fact that there is one pharaoh is observation that everybody made, and you can just you know make and um, recognize when you read the text. But the significance of this observation, to the best of my knowledge, was not discussed until we published our books about a quarter of a century ago. Wow! Um, the book was called. History testifies to the infallibility of the Quran. That's the first time, to the best of my Now, obviously, viewers, anybody, please, who have um, information that's different from what I'm saying here, please share with me. If you think anybody has discussed what I'm going to talk to, now you can find it now on the internet, people using it, but it didn't exist. The book came out in 98, 99. 
um, and then um, we actually uh, rewrote it after 10 years just to make it easier to read. Um, it was, I, I wrote it, co-wrote it with my wife, Dr. Shadi Dergazeli. So that is when it came out. And that's the first time, uh, to best, best of my knowledge, in Arabic or English or any language that this was tried. But let's go through the exercise and see uh, what's, what's about. Taking the story of the Quran and presuming that there, is, there was only one Pharaoh there, we can identify four stages uh, in Moses' life that would allow us to work out how long this pharaoh uh, um, was in power for. These are, we know that when Moses was born, pharaoh was already in power, that one pharaoh. And then, but we don't know for how long. He could have been in power for five years, one year, one day, 10 years, we don't know. Moses' age when he left Egypt. So he lived there until he killed the Egyptian. At some point afterwards, he feared for his life. He had to leave. Then he stayed in Midian for a period of time. And then he came back to, um, uh, to Egypt, where he stayed in Egypt for a period of time. Now, if we put this, add this together, we should have an idea about how long that Pharaoh reigned for. Now, the first is unknown. The Quran does not tell us how long Pharaoh was in power when Moses was born. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any indication, direct, indirect, that would allow us um, to make any conclusion. So we're left with the three periods. But what that means is whatever is the sum of the other three would only point to the minimum reigning time, the minimum, because there's a period we have we can't add to, but we know it exists, which is how long Pharaoh was in power when Moses was born. It, 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 Paul, is it clear? Or yeah, no, no, it's perfectly clear. No, I get this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Then, now, Moses, Moses' age when he left Egypt, at some point, the Quran says about Moses, um, uh, is usually translated as attained his full strength. That expression is, is taken to mean a, a wide range uh, of um, kind of period in one's life, uh, but it means that one's a physically strong the strongest, if you like. And that's usually must refer to something in the region of 18 years or so, a minimum. Now, in the case of, uh, of uh, some exegetes, take it even further, of course. In the case of uh, some take it to up to 40, up to 40. Um, in my view, given the number of instances, this expression occurs in the Quran, I see it to refer from adulthood when somebody 18, just about 18, to when to old age. That period, that whole period is actually called Ashuddahu, But in the case of Moses, there's something very important to notice here. And for those who are believe that every word in the Quran is meaningful, they should take notice of that. Now the description of Moses occurs also uh, as a de description of Joseph with one single word difference. In the case of Moses, it says, in the, case, uh, in the case of Joseph, it says, when he attained his full strength, we gave him uh, knowledge and wisdom. In the case of Moses, it adds another word, wastawa. Stawa um, means become, obviously, uh, you can't translate it as matured, matured as in mentally. But why stawa also gives the impression of being level-headed? Why is that? Because there were 
significant difference, several differences in character between Joseph and Moses. If you remember the story of both, uh, in the case of Moses, we have somebody who's quite impulsive, can get angry quite quickly. He actually killed somebody just to defend his, um, um, you know, one of his own uh, people. And he was so impulsive that next time he had exactly the same person seeking his help. After he killed the first one, he asked for forgiveness. So he knew he made just a mistake, big mistake. But then next time he was going to do the same, to kill the second person when he was again uh, called for help. So you can see this kind of impulsive behavior. And it continued actually with him uh, even later. You remember when he came back with the tablets and they found the Israelites in their situation, the situation they were in, worshiping another god, etc. Um, and then what did he do? He actually, he threw, cast down the tablets and he almost attacked Aaron, his brother, until he calmed down. When Aaron told him, I was just helpless and I tried to make the best of the situation, keeping the Israelites together, etc. So his character is different. Whereas if you look at the story of Joseph, you only see somebody who's patient, meek, somebody in the worst of circumstances will just hit. The only reaction you find is patience, just really, really strange character. And that, in my view, explains the word wastawa, the additional word added after uh, he attained full strength in the case of Moses. So there's a longer period that after which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described that I gave him knowledge and wisdom. So he had to wait longer. Now, the estimate we made about that is maybe 20, 24. Let's go no further than that. However, I have to say exegetes say 40 exegete, most of them say 40. As soon as you put istawa with balagha um, shudda, um, full attendance, full strength, you're talking 40, but let's be uh, kind of conservative here. Now, um, he moved, he escaped, um, and went to Midian. In Midian, uh, he met his future wife. Um, then his future father-in-law told him, I'm happy, to marry you, my, my daughter, if you in return as a dowry, um, you then work for me for eight to 10 years. And he left after that. We don't know how long he did. Now, um, did he stay eight or 10? The Quran says he fulfilled the promise. But given that Moses helped his um, future wife and future sister-in-law um, when he first met them without knowing them and a return for nothing, he's a clearly a person who was trying to help. This is why he also intervened in the case of his, um, the Israelites who asked for his help. So I would argue that he must have stayed uh, the full term, 10 years. But again, we have no evidence to say that beside this argument. Um, so let's say he stayed eight as a minimum, 10 as a maximum. But then how long? did he stay uh, in Egypt? Uh, this is slightly more difficult because I'm going to say 8 to 10 and I'm going to explain why. Let me read one verse from the Quran that talks about the plagues here. It says, we certainly seized the people of Pharaoh with years of famine and a deficiency in the fruits. Then it goes on to say, but when good came to them, they said, this is our right. This is ours by right. And if a bad condition struck them, they say an evil omen uh, in Moses and those with him. So they accuse Moses of being the reason why whatever struck them, struck them. So what do we have here? We have mention of years of famine, but then it's followed by what seems to be alternating fortune. Uh, and that cannot be in months. It must be in years. So we could find a year where it was dry, famine, drought, etc., And then another year, that's when they complain it's all because of the bad omen that Moses and his 
uh, fellow Israelites. Uh, but then in, in the following year, it would become no. It's, um, you know, it's good year, rain, etc. And they are happy and they think, yeah, that's because we deserve that. So the, the, the imagery uh, that we get out of that is that Moses must have stayed for years there, number of years. And then, obviously, um, uh, you have the, um, the plagues that happened afterwards. Now, these plagues, uh, there is no indication that they were kind of a sequence of events that happened one after another within a week or a day. Now, there are those who try to suggest um, that they did. So they followed each other. Often, those who follow that line of thinking are those who rationalize miracles. In other words, they talk about the flood and the flood can happen, etc. It's a, it's a kind of um, underhand way of treating really the text here, because the text is a clear talking about miracles. If you want to turn it into something else, well, you might just say anything there. Uh, why would you stand at that? Why would you want to keep yourself kind of obliged by the text anyway? You might as well, well, it's not even a flood. It was something else. So you have then flood and the flood, the result of the flood was then what followed afterwards. And suddenly you have a sequence uh, of natural events. A lot of scholars do that and they need to do that because of what you mentioned uh, earlier, Paul, because of their pre-commitment to a, a natural, completely natural world where the supernatural has no place. If that's your underlying and starting assumption, well, that's your only way to go. Um, the second would be to dismiss the whole text and Exodus altogether. So if you don't do that, and if you look at the text as it is, well, clearly there is a, there's kind of these uh, are presented as individual separate miracles, each of which is intended to impact the, the, the Egyptians, the uh, Pharaoh, to get him to agree. And it doesn't happen. And then uh, another miracle takes place. We don't know how long uh, that lasted for, but we know it must be uh, happened over a long period of time. And we know that the text took years. Another significant indication in the Qur'an is that at some point, the Qur'an tells Moses and uh, Aaron, sorry, to take houses for you, for, for your people. So they were asked uh, to, um, to live or, or kind of build houses or that the impression you get, um, take houses for themselves and for their people. So it sounds like we're talking about something of a long stay. Uh, why is it mentioned in, this, in these terms? It can be a bit too technical and too speculative to go through it um, in this particular discussion. Uh, but there are reasons why um, that, that might, might be the case. But the, the, um, the obvious meaning is that we're talking about a stay of some length uh, this isn't that Moses going into Egypt um, within a week or two, months or two, um, just, you know, ending uh, the situation, leaving uh, with the Israelites. No, we're talking years, and that the years and the concept of years is mentioned explicitly and implicitly in the Quran. We put eight to ten as an estimate, but it could be more. Now, <clears throat> If we put together these three figures, we get a minimum of 36 to 42 years. But that is a minimum. Let me remind ourselves why it's a minimum, because the first are nothing about. Pharaoh could have been in power if he was in power for Jesus was born. We need to add another 10 years to the figures we ended up with and the figure will become even uh, bigger and bigger. To compare this with the Bible, according to the Bible, Moses uh, came back to Egypt when he was 80 years old, and he stayed uh, for 40 years or so in, the, in Midian, 
um, and then he stayed, and, and he came back when he was 80, but the events are very fast, uh, fast-paced, and he left pretty quickly uh, with the exodus. And there's also what looks like to me um, a, a bit of a um, um, potential contradiction in the Bible, because when he left Egypt, we're told that he put his wife and sons on a donkey. Now, the description suggests to me the text is talking about small children. That's not the image I would get um, talking about adults who are supposed to be adults. Um, but it looks like the case um, that, uh, you know, it, it, it seems to be talking about children. And there's also another reference to his wife cutting the foreskin of one of his sons, which again might be suggesting uh, that he didn't stay that long and the children were young. But that's kind of... Um, a side point. I don't want to dwell on that. But that's basically what we're talking. So we're talking about a pharaoh that reigned for at least 40 years, but potentially uh, a lot more. Now, who's that pharaoh then? Who that? There must be a unique pharaoh, maybe. Yeah. There are two, three pharaohs. There are actually only two that uh, kind of foot the bill here. If I'm going to mention three of them, there's one, Amenhotep III, and Thotmosis III as well, and Ramses II. So in the case of um, Amenhotep III, he was actually in power for only 37 years. Uh, by the way, there are three, these are three from the whole of the second millennium BCE. So we're, we're covering just the whole um, kind of millennium in which Moses uh, lived, Joseph lived. So not only the period, obviously, the small period surrounding Moses. This is the whole second millennium. The um, difficulty with that is that uh, in, in the, the issue with Amenhotep III is that he, he was put in, um, in power when he was, I think, 6 to 12. Uh, years old, so he was uh, very small. So he likely, he had a regent uh, to um, effectively uh, lead um, until uh, he became an adult. But even without that, uh, we're talking at a very small, uh, young um, kind of um, pharaoh. Yet the pharaoh, uh, who, who, sorry, who um, reigned only for 37 years, that the pharaoh that we are looking for is somebody who was already married when Moses uh, was born. So even if we consider 37 as a kind of close figure, which it isn't really, um, it's still, it, he, it wouldn't work. So we moved to whom? To the second. Uh, Thotmosis um, reigned for uh, 54 years, and that sounds like a potential candidate. The problem is that he was only um, two years old, um, when he became um, a pharaoh. So um, the real pharaoh was actually uh, his um, um, uh, stepmother um, and an aunt, uh, Hapshutsut, who actually uh, remained in the real pharaoh in control for 22 years. Effectively, he was a pharaoh for only 33 years. Ramesses the second reigned ah, longest ever, 67, yeah. 67 years. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying here is that the Quran suggests that it must have been Ramesses the second. Mm -hmm. um, that method, if that was something that the Quran, the Bible has has said about the pharaoh, you would have found whole books being written about it because every word, every letter, every possibility is discussed, etc. But the Quran obviously is of no interest um, to most Western scholars. So the fact that the Quran talks about uh, one pharaoh uh, hasn't been picked up, uh, looked at its significance, whether it adds. So when we look for evidence on the historicity 
of the account in the Old Testament, we consider just about anything and everything. And you saw how we look for every piece of circumstantial evidence. That is not considered, even though, not how it stands on its own without even any need for reference to biblical text here. Mm-hmm. This is just the Quran. All we need to know, uh, information about ancient Egypt, and that's how the two match. And that's how we get actually a match for the Pharaoh uh, we are after. Right, but the Quran doesn't identify this Pharaoh only in this way. So um, this is the second indication in the Quran uh, that allows us to identify uh, the, this particular uh, Pharaoh. Uh, the Quran describes this Pharaoh as Dhul Autad, Dhul Autad, uh, of Autad. So the the, the question is what Autad exactly is. Hmm. Um, a lot of scholars uh, say Autad it means um, some kind of poles, uh, things that are used for crucifixion because he was oh, yeah. mentioned to have a crucif- cru- crucified some people. However, um, let me quote two particular verses that would show us the likely meaning of this word. So this is one verse, we have, have we not made the earth plain and the mountains outad? So as you can see here, there's some kind of contrast between the fact that the earth is a plain level and the mountains being outad. And contrasting these two suggests to me that outad is talking about something tall, high rather than uh, a plain uh, and uh, level. And then if we look at this particular area, we should make things even clearer. Have you not considered how your law dealt with Ad, Iram, another term for Ad usually is considered, who had lofty pillars, the likes of which had never been created in the land, and with Thamud, who carved out the rocks in the valley, and with Pharaoh of the Altad. And now, if you look at these three places in this passage, so we're talking about lofty pillars. So this is a people um, who used to build those lofty pillars, and then Thamud, who used to build houses, buildings, they mm-hmm. carved out of rocks, and then Pharaoh of the Autad. The context suggests to me that we're talking about buildings, as in, in the same way, left the pillars are about buildings, and those Thamud used also to create buildings out of uh, rock um, in, in, in the valley. And then Pharaoh is uh, described as Pharaoh of the Autad. And in fact, the, so the three kind of two nations and Pharaoh are builders. So talking about those, because building um, shows some kind of power, control, uh, etc. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, look at how we destroyed all of those. Build, um, you know, put together all kinds of uh, buildings, but we have, uh, we demolished them. And um, it's interesting that one of the, uh, uh, inter- kind of um, explanations of the word autad attributed to Ibn Abbas, um, the companion, mm. says secure buildings. Interesting. Secure buildings. Uh, another successor called Abdahak, he says uh, about Pharaoh of the autad, he used to build a lot. Buildings are called autad. Mm. Buildings, and you can find this uh, in the Tabari uh, commentary uh, on the word autad. So, but what is the significance of that? Well, Ramses II is known to have built like no one else, uh-huh. none of the other pharaohs. He was the greatest builders uh, of all pharaohs. What you have here is Dhul Autad. Um, is similar to Shardimatun Qalilun in the sense that we have 
two word um, phrase that explains history in a rather unique way. That's when we talked about the number of the Israelites being a small band. And here you have Dhul Autad of the buildings. Mm. Uh, and again, reference to the most unique way of identifying um, this particular uh, pharaoh. And I would like to show two gigantic temples he built, which are relevant to what we're going to talk about. This is one of them, the Ramesseum. Ramesseum is a mortuary temple, memorial temple that Ramesses II built for himself. And it took 20 years to build. Uh, it's a huge. Um, uh, it's in, in Upper uh, Egypt, um, in Luxor. And uh, the second um, building is the temple, the small temple in Abu Simbel. Uh, and Abu, Abu Simbel has two, the large temple, which you would have seen like two huge statues of seated Ramses II next to each other. The small temple, which is the one we're interested in here or showing here in the picture, uh, has uh, four statues uh, of Ramses and two of his uh, wife, Nefertari. Uh, it's actually one of the unusual kind of um, architectures here because it's, it's very unusual uh, for um, anybody to be given almost the same size as the pharaoh mm. uh, when they create, um, you know, statues for them. Uh, but that is uh, the case uh, in this particular uh, situation. And let's see why this is particular. And I've chosen these particular two, and he's built a lot, but these are two that we're going to get back to. Um, wrong buildings in the wrong place. So what does that mean? Mm. This is written on the small temple we saw earlier, dedication. Ramses II has made a temple excavated in the mountain of external workmanship for the chief queen, Nefertari, beloved of Mut, Mut is a god, goddess, Nefertari for whom the sun shines. And this temple was dedicated to Hather, which is a goddess, uh, and Nefertari uh, herself, to bas basically she was uh, deified as well. So what has this to do with what we're talking about? Well, this explains this particular prayer by the wife of Pharaoh, which the Quran mentions. And Allah cites an example for those who believe the wife of Pharaoh when she said, my Lord, Build for me with you a house in paradise and save me from Pharaoh and his deeds and save me from the wrongdoing people. And the close of interest here is build for me with you a house in paradise. This is a unique prayer. We don't have a similar prayer uh, in the uh, Quran attributed to anybody else talking in those particular terms. Now, contrast this um, dua, this prayer, with the dedication to his other wife, whatever that Nefetari. We don't know who the wife of Pharaoh here that the Quran mentions, but contrast this as if she's saying, I don't want to be treated like other wives or another wife. I don't want to have a temple dedicated to me. I don't want to have huge buildings by Pharaoh. I don't want to be treated as if I was some kind of a deity. So, as, as an alternative, what I want is rather a house with you, God, mm. in paradise. Mm. That, for me, is very significant. It's subtle, but it's straightforward comparison. Why his wife, in particular, um, uses this particular, um, uh, Pharaoh's wife uh, would use this particular uh, prayer. Wow. Now, do you see the point, Paul, here? It, it's a remarkably subtle point. I've not heard it before. And um, given the identification of Ramesses II as the pharaoh, which it would seem to be a good case, then these subtle connections that you've made certainly come into play uh, very, very, nice, very beautifully. So thank you for that. The way with Ibn Li Baytan, it's a house. It's not even a palace. So humble, so beautiful. 
And it's comparing that with that when you put them together, the contrast becomes really quite stark and remarkable. Mm-hmm. And she's saying, I don't want any of those. Now, um, who that wife is? Well, um, Ramses II uh, had several wives. Though he had queens and he had lesser queens as well. So uh, probably the seven, eight well-known, including Nefertari. I think she died when he was in his 25th uh, regnal year, um, but he had others. Uh, the last of which was a Hittite princess. And I think they say that he married another one, her sister, after she died. But we don't know nothing about it. And there are others we don't know anything about. My guess, and this is speculation, is that I don't expect to find anything written in particular about this good, good woman, uh, good woman in, in, in anywhere. Because why would they want to mention her? Probably he killed her. In fact, in... Um, uh, Islamic exegete, uh, this particular dua is cited uh, as something she said while being tortured by yeah. Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. So, um, because obviously she was against him, she wasn't, um, uh, she didn't want to follow his religion, etc. And you can see, um, uh, was she influenced by Moses? We don't know whether there was any contact, but it's possible, of course. Um, it's maybe even probable. In what way? We don't know. But what we know is this strange, on the one hand, he's called Dhul Autad. We know he was the greatest of all builders in the ancient in ancient Egypt. And then we have his wife asking for a house instead of anything. And he doesn't want anything from him. She wants it uh, from, from God. Mm-hmm. What's interesting as well, uh, uh, Paul, about um, this this kind of the three pieces we've just talked about, the long reigning Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Autat, and this particular prayer of his wife, the three of them can be used uh, to identify Pharaoh with no reference to the Bible, Hmm. no reference to any other source other than what we know from ancient Egypt, history of Egypt, and the Quran. And the significance of that is because, as we spoke earlier, um, those um, most scholars considered the Quran as a poor copy mm. of the Bible. So it's copied, yet none of this is actually um, uh, needs even the Bible, and it doesn't. It doesn't come from the Bible. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> Sign for later generations. And um, I think you know probably what we're talking about. This is the Bible um, talking about what happened um, when uh, Moses crossed the sea with his people and he was. Uh, yes. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. That's the emphasis. And then it goes on. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. I'm not sure about that, how they could see them, because you would expect them to have gone and crossed, and these to have drowned on the other side um, uh, of the sea. But that's what it says. But what's interesting is that the mention that not one of them remained. They all died. And then we have, the, if I actually go back a little before that and just comment here, make a comment, um, I, it, it, it's worth saying. The, the um, scholars, biblical scholars, believe that Manaptah, who's the son of Ramses II, was the pharaoh of the Exodus, quite a few of them. And the, that comes from the two pharaoh uh, model of the Bible. So Ramses II would be then um, the oppression pharaoh. Uh, his son, Mernipta, would be the exodus pharaoh because supposedly the oppression pharaoh died while Moses was, as you know, uh, in Midian. As a result, when in 1881, uh, the, they found um, a cache of mummies uh, at the tomb, including the tomb of 
Manata, his mommy wasn't there. And everyone said, jumped, yeah, here we go. Because he drowned, obviously we don't expect to find his mommy. Hmm. Because he drowned. And it's Manata. So everybody was, you know, that's exactly what they expected. That what, that what the Bible said. Unfortunately, 17 years later, hmm. Manata's mommy was found. Now the excitement is gone. Um, and then the prediction and the model had to be revised. So Manata's uh, mommy is there. Um, this is, however, what the Quran says. We took the children of Israel across the sea, and Pharaoh and his soldiers pursued them in tyranny and enmity until when drowning overtook him, he said, I believe that there is no God except that in whom the children of Israel believe, and I am of the Muslims. Now, having disobeyed earlier and were of the corruptors, so today we will save you in the body that you may be a sign for those who succeed you. Many people are heedless of our signs. Obviously, what uh, stands out here is the statement uh, of uh, saving him yeah. uh, in the body and to be a sign to those who come after him to succeed him. Um, and this is obviously quite um, an unusual uh, statement. If you think about it, um, drowned, everybody drowned. Why would um, the Quran make this statement? In fact, if you compare it with things like um, uh, references in the Quran to other nations, ancient nations, whom uh, the, um, the, 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 the believers or people at the time of the Prophet uh, are kind of um, told or reminded that they can walk through their relics or uh, historic sites. They are no, there's no mention uh, of anybody surviving, anybody there, even when the Quran talks about the flood at the time of Noah, including his, his son who refused to join him, and it singles him out, and then he actually drowned. It doesn't say that he saved his body. Again, what you find here is quite a unique uh, description. Yeah, can, can I can I just sh share with you, if I may, uh, 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 to, uh, another a translation uh, to add to your your excellent translation? Uh, uh, another one that also brings this point out. You're making very clearly Abdul Halim and his translation uh, says we took the children of Israel across the sea. Pharaoh and his troops pursued them in arrogance and aggression. But as he was drowning, he cried, I believe there is no God except the one the children of Israel believe in. I submit to him. And then God says in response, now, when you had always been a rebel and a troublemaker, exclamation mark, today we shall save only your corpse as a sign to all posterity. Today we shall save only your corpse as a sign to all posterity posterity so this is a room a very odd thing to say uh if we, in the context of the other passage you mentioned about noah of course uh but a specific promise to preserve we shall save your corpse as a sign so where is this sign that the whole world saying well you've just told us the exactly. sign was discovered amazingly to confirm Really, very incredibly, what the Quran has stated there as a fact that this has, has been preserved, and behold, we we have the we have the um, the mummy, the corpse, eighteen eighty one, eighteen eighty one, no less. Yeah, the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, died six thirty two. Wow, eighteen eighty twelve centuries. So what would have possessed? What would have possessed? I mean, just thinking on a purely naturalistic level, what would have possessed a man in the seventh century? I mean, this is not obviously right. the belief, but why would a man have made this statement? I mean, what possible reason, motive? What would have been? It's just so random. Uh, it's, I, I, it doesn't kind of make much sense on the level of the of the Muslim narrative. It makes more sense, of course, because it is a sign, and it has actually come out come true in a way that I'm sure the Prophet Muhammad, upon be peace, was not expecting to happen in the 19th century, so many centuries later, you know, it, it's because it's uh, in a definite period in the future, but it is remarkable. It is. Paul, uh, in a previous um, program, we spoke about the non 
crucifixion verse, and I made the point at the time that the why would the prophet mm. uh, author mm. such a statement that Jesus wasn't crucified, where the Jews said he crucified, the Christians accepted as a crucifixion, everything, and everybody said he crucified. Now, everyone believed it. What possible exactly. advantage would it be to a prophet or, or now, what, a, a self-proclaimed the, prophet to say that? Yeah, and, and, and he had everything to lose and nothing everything to lose. Everything to lose in terms of credibility, and unless, of course, it happened to be the truth that God was telling right. him. Now, the one thing, regardless of those who accept the Quran or don't accept Accept it. There's some, by the way, obviously, who say, oh, no, the Quran is ambiguous about that. But even that is a problem. Why would he be ambiguous? He's trying to create a problem for himself. So yeah. ambiguity and the fact they say, oh, it actually does mean that he was a crucifixion. But then even if you say that, any Arab, if you give it to any Arab, it, it, it means he, he was not a crucified. So he had everything to lose. This is a similar situation. But I'll tell you what, this is even more difficult. Think about it. In the case of Jesus, the Quran made that claim. There is no expectations on the, ba- on the back of that claim. But in this particular case with Pharaoh, there is some expectation that yeah. was yet not fulfilled. Because it was a sign. It wasn't just, oh, we'll, we'll uh-huh. preserve his body somewhere and no one's going to see it, but we're going to preserve it anyway. No, it will be preserved as a sign. And a sign is by definition meant to be witness, like the signs of creation. They point to something. They point to God saving Pharaoh bodily for posterity. So this is a falsifiable claim in the Quran. Uh, actually, um, if, if it was never found or never seen, then that would be evidence against the Quran, arguably. And, and that exactly, I mean, just think of the Prophet Sallallahu at the time. So the Jews would have gone to him and said, well, you say that. There's no evidence of that. There's no mention of that. He would have had absolutely no way of yeah. proving the veracity of the statement of the Quran. Where that takes us back is to the fact that the prophet was a, a receiver. He wasn't an author. He had no way of interfering with the text. قُلْ مَا أُبَدِّلُهُ In the mean, مَا أُبَدِّلُهُ مِنْ تِلْقَاءِ نَفْسِي I was not, I were not to change it out of my own will when he was challenged about changing the Quran to meet whatever expectations of the people at the time. So what you have a situation here where the prophet has been given this that says it will be generation for, for the people later, um, um, kind of a sign. There's no evidence of it at the time. He has no way of explaining no. that, that statement. Yet, yet, if there was anything about, if you talk about the preservation of the Quran, well, the people who compiled the Quran People say afterwards, whatever. Well, they would have known that evidence did not exist. Did they try to remove it? No, they didn't. They kept it in. Even though the Prophet couldn't give any evidence on it, they were even more or less so. But it was left in the Quran. And the other point to mention here is, I don't think it's it's a coincidence that Moses defeated the greatest pharaoh of all. There's some symbolic meaning there, some reference. If it was Ramses II, as we're saying, and as most who believe actually in the Exodus, the history of the Exodus say, then effectively Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Moses to defeat the greatest of all pharaohs. It's Mm. a symbolic message. He defeated the whole of Egypt, all Terrans, all of those dictators, all of those who who kind of claimed, including, of course, divinity. Because in the case of um, uh, Pharaoh, that's what he claimed, Ramses II. And also remember when we saw earlier the, uh, um, the, the mortuary temple that he wanted to be, remembered for well that was completely undermined as well wasn't he that's not how he's remembered at the moment but definitely for an increasing percentage of the population of this earth he's remembered differently mm-hmm. on the terms of the quran not on on on, on his own terms that's mm-hmm. how we remember him that's what his mummy tells us is a reminder us of the quran okay
Now, um, it's interesting as well to add to that, if we look at the earliest mention, mentions of Israel uh, that we have, because it's significant and relevant to what we're talking about here. There's something called uh, Manapta Israel Stella. Uh, Manapta, as we said, is the son um, of uh, Ramses II and the pharaoh who took over after him. Uh, this Stella uh, was found at the end of the 19th century. It talks about uh, victories, military victories by Manapta against the Libyans, but it also talks about adventures and supposed victories he had in Canaan. And that's where the message, uh, the passage of interest, um, not to a lot of people, is because there it concludes this stella, it's, I think 28 lines or so, it concludes with this Israel is laid waste, his seed is not. Um, this was written sometime around the fifth regnal year of Manipta. Now, this is what's really significant. We've just seen that, what, what it says, we have the first mention of Israel being somewhere outside Egypt five years, or that's the date is usually given, after the death of Ramses II. Mm. First mention of Israel outside Egypt by his follower, his, his successor. His successor is making clearly uh, an exaggerated claim, but the claim itself is very significant. Why would Manapta claim specifically that Israel is no more? Because his, his father is no more. Israel is the reason why his father was dead, as if he's inflicting revenge here against Israel. Uh, by making this obviously clearly a uh, uh, false statement, because obviously Israel uh, were not done there. And uh, this also occurs in text that um, uh, refers to cities um, also he supposedly attacked. What's interesting is that the others are cities, fortified cities, etc. Israel is the only um, kind of subject of his victory that are referred to as a people, not a city, because they were not at the time in any kind of fortified city. They haven't settled. But regardless of the accuracy of this statement, it's the significance of making this statement that is uh, quite remarkable here. The fact that he should uh, make that claim uh, about Israel and mention them this quickly after uh, the death of his father. It's even more remarkable if he made it up. Why he make it up? I mean, Israel wasn't like uh, the Hittites. It wasn't a huge empire. Mm. It, wasn't, it wasn't going to achieve anything by just talking about them this way. He had some um, kind of, he had some problem with these specific people. Yeah. Now, um, the second mention here. This is the earliest mention of the kingdom of Israel. It comes of um, the Stella of uh, Mesha. Omri is a king, I think sixth king, um, sixth king of Israel. Ahab is also uh, mentioned there. Um, and the, what's interesting is the date. There's about uh, three centuries and a half between the earliest mention in Israel and the second earliest mention of Israel. And the same applies when we look um, at uh, the earliest mention uh, of Israelite. And this is Ahab, the Israelites, in uh, Shalamansa, the third inscription, the Assyrian uh, king. And Israelite here, Ahab is a king, seventh king uh, of Israel. So, what, what, what is, apart from the significance of the Manipta's stela and the mention of Israel, it really is quite remarkable that we have a gap in our records of 350 years in which we don't know have we don't have any mention of Israel yet. We know where they were there. They developed the kingdom, etc. All of that. So by the time the second earliest mention occurred, they're already a kingdom. In fact, they had already few kings. 
that takes us back to the point we mentioned earlier about the the fact that um, absence of evidence is no evidence of absence, in particular when we're talking ancient history. And that is a living example of what we spoke about. Mm -hmm. Again, this is the date, as you can see. All right. Now, Haman. Ah, yes. So, who's Haman? Um, in the Quran, there's um, a, a person, a commander, second in command to Pharaoh, called Haman. Uh, he was involved in the um, um, in the confrontation uh, against Moses. So, you find the expression Fir'aun wa Haman wa junudu huma, as in Fir'aun. Haman, uh, Pharaoh Haman, and their soldiers. So clearly he had some kind of political uh, role, a military uh, role there. Um, and then there's also mention at some point that um, when uh, Moses made the claims about his God, uh, that um, the Quran says that uh, Pharaoh told Haman uh, to build for him a tower so he could try and verify what Moses is saying about his God. Now, clearly this person, Haman, uh, ha must have some kind of religious um, kind of office as well, potentially combining these two of some form, which is why uh, he was consulted uh, about building a tower. So he would build uh, also, uh, he would also, he was also involved in the military uh, leadership uh, in Egypt. Uh, that does not exist. That person does not exist. In um, I, I should add that Haman seems to be a title, like um, Pharaoh, not a name of a person. That's how treated in the text. Um, the story of uh, the, Quran, the Bible does not have a Haman in the Exodus, but there's the book of Esther, which has a Haman, and that um, has obviously attracted a lot of attention because the Bible has it in Esther, whereas the Quran uh, has uh, Haman. Uh, and the, Quran, the Quran has it obviously in the story of Moses and uh, Bible in Esther. It's interesting, just as an aside uh, a point, the, uh, the book of Esther in the Jewish Bible is the only book in the Bible that doesn't never mentions God ever. <laughs> God is never doesn't mentioned God. God, it doesn't mention God, but God, uh, God he, he's simply absent uh, uh, as a directly referred to subject in right. the in the in the uh, the book of yes. Esther. But the book of Esther itself, we won't go to that book now, is hugely important today for Jews, which I'm not going to go into. It's part of the, the their narrative, or, uh, which is celebrated every year. You can look it up, just Google it. This is not a, a dusty old book. This is a book that's very important to contemporary Jews uh, in terms of their um, in their religious life. But anyway, it doesn't mention the word God at all. Interesting. Yeah. Paul is the only book of the Hebrew Bible that is not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Ah, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, which is which is which should tell say something because it it always had a problem with um being considered as part of the canon mm -hmm. uh, of the Jews. And it took a few ye a few centuries before it became accepted mm -hmm. as a canonical uh, right. book. So, um, and that's, you know, for a, a kind of, in some way, uh, understandable. The, to go back to the content, you referred to the absence of animation, mention of uh, God. It's really a story about the Jews in uh, Persia, under under Persian control, um, it talks about um, a king, um, uh, Ahasuerus, um, Persian king, who appointed um, a Haman to the office of prime minister. There was a courtier, Jewish courtier, called Mordecai. Mm. For whatever reason, unexplained, Mordecai refused to bow to Haman. Haman got really angry, decided to destroy all of the Jews there. However, as the story develops, we learn that Esther, uh, who was a relative of Mordecai and a wife. A princess. Uh, yeah, she's a, 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 the heroine of the story. That's why it's yeah. named after her, Esther. Yeah. Correct. And she was uh, married to Ahasuerus, uh, managed at the end uh, to um, prevail, and Haman 
uh, was actually uh, impaled on the stake. So that's that's kind of in in uh, in a nutshell what the story about. Um, the one thing to note about it is that um, the the story. I think if I share my screen, probably be better. The story is has historical problems. Mm. For instance, um, it talks um, about Persia. Um, having uh, 127 provinces. In fact, it had only 30 at most. Also, the king himself, Azurus, um, doesn't exist, is not uh, historical. Uh, nobody, um, uh, you know, they, nobody could identify uh, such a king. So what happened is, publicists, scholars, uh, tried to say that maybe he actually is not, that's not his name. Uh, he's actually uh, the well-known Persian king, Xerxes. But there is no evidence on that. Uh, this is effectively, uh, we're kind of um, uh, uh, trying to uh, deli- kind of force uh, history uh, on this book. Uh, what's interesting, some translations of the Bible do not put actually the original name uh, Azorius. They use Xerxes. And the reader wouldn't know that actually this is an extrapolation, an assumption that is added to the text of the Bible. Um, This includes um, the NIV, New International Version, uh, the New Living Translation, and others. Uh, Even uh, the uh, NRSV uh, says um, it, it, it's a probably Xerxes, but there is no evidence. The point is, they're trying to, to add some history to it. But even those who say that accept and acknowledge it is completely fictional. The events there, what happens in that um, um, book is fictional. It just has nothing to do. It's not history. It's some kind of novella, some kind of story there. Yet, we are told that the Quranic Haman was copied of the biblical Haman. What we talk about here, Paul, is something, and I published a book in 2007 on the historical Jesus, and I introduced a term called contextual displacement. And what I meant by that, we're always told that the Quran has copied something purely from the Bible and put it in the wrong context. My argument, it's actually the other way around. So it's contextual displacement. So give you an example. We have an example here where Haman originally was in Egypt. When the book of Esther was written, somehow Haman moved to Esther. Now, think about this in a very simple way. If you give somebody the name Haman and you don't tell them nothing about it and tell them, here's a quiz. Is this name likely to be Persian, Jewish, uh, Persian or Egyptian? They would tell you Egyptian right away because of the ending Haman, Hamun, which is it's, it's very close to the name of the Egyptian god there. Uh, So this is what I call contextual displacement, moving from character, concept from uh, one uh, context to another, but it's the exact opposite of what um, usually Western scholars say. Uh, This is supposed to say it's actually the Bible that has things moved around in the wrong way. Let me give you one example uh, on what I mean here. So in Genesis, it says, and I read here, quote, let us make let let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness now compare this with what the quran says he fashioned you and made your shapes good it uses the word image surah image in arabic but look at the difference between the two the concept of the quran relates to the its overall conception of god Nothing is like him. He's unlike anything else. Even though, even though wherever you go, he, he's there. But he's unlike anything. He cannot be reached by our eyes. 
He's everywhere, but he's unlike anything else. He could not have created anything in his image. In other words, that is the Quranic statement. The biblical statement, he is created as us in his image. Now, what you see here is what I call the human factor. In the same way we spoke about storytelling at, as a human activity, and you listen how to a particular account is being recounted, and you say, well, this is how a human being would recount something. Whereas you look at the Quran and say, well, I can't make sense of that. It's unlike anything I know on how history is usually narrated. Same thing here. So there's one example, but there are other examples uh, not to get into at the moment, but what I'm saying is that this is an example of um, uh, the reverse of what Western scholars say. The genuine Haman is actually the real historical Haman is the one that was in the story of Moses, not the one that is in a fictional book, and everybody knows is fictional, book of Esther. So why Moses, not Haman? So what does that mean? When scholars come to Moses, the name Moses, Moses is the meaning of the name Moses is mentioned actually in the Exodus. They say when the daughter of Pharaoh picked him up from the river in his basket, uh, she called him that a name that meant uh, he was drawn out of water. Um, and the problem is the name, the way is derived, the etymology of it, um, is, is the wrong Hebrew etymology because it requires a passive participle, whereas what is used in the Bible is active participle. So it's wrong, wrong etymology. But there is an even more significant observation. That name is actually Egyptian. It's not Hebrew. Mm. Uh, we have a lot of names in Egypt that uh, end with MSI and C, so Ramesses, uh, Ahmes, uh, Totmosis. So that is the name missing any god as a prefix to that name. So the name of Moses is Egyptian. So what's the significance of this and what's its relevance to what we're talking about? Haman. Well, here you have an example where scholars, everybody, that I'm not aware of any exception, agree that this is a name that actually it's Egyptian, not Hebrew, and they acknowledge that's an Egyptian name that was presented in the Bible, in the Bible as Hebrew. And they are happy to disagree with the Bible on that. Why not do the same with Haman? Why not consider the fact that this name does sound like very much an Egyptian name, not a Persian name? But no, everybody is equally confident that Haman is actually from Esther, the book that is not historical, and the author of the Quran somehow confused. That's what the Encyclopedia of Islam says. Confu somehow, for an inex inexplicable reason, confused it. Double standards, to say the least. I'm going to end with two uh, slides um, just quickly here. Uh, comparing the dialogue between Moses and, uh, and Pharaoh in the Bible and the Quran. So, Moses and, Pharaoh, and Aaron went to Pharaoh and told him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. It goes on. They said, The God of the Hebrews has revealed himself to us. Let us go a three days journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord our God. In this passage, I've highlighted in black, the God of Israel, my people, the God of the Hebrews, Lord our God. That's how God is described uh, by supposedly Moses. He's trying to tell Pharaoh about that God. This is another piece. Say to him, that's this time God is teaching um, Moses what to say. The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you to say, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. What you have here is an ethnocentric God who has an ethnocentric mission just to take Israel out of uh, Egypt. There's absolutely no interest 
in the Egyptians, in Pharaoh, nothing. The description of God here is very much how a, a God, local God, would have been described by the Egyptians, our God, because different people had different gods there. Now, contrast this with the Quran. Go to Pharaoh and say, you are the messengers, that's to Moses and Aaron, of the Lord of the peoples, the Lord of the heavens and earth, and that between them, if you should be convinced, your Lord and the Lord of your first forefathers, the Lord of the east and the west, and that between them, if you have understanding. Mm -hmm. Look at the other piece. Speak to him with gentle speech that he may remember or fear Allah. Look at the interest of Allah, even in Pharaoh. We know every prophet was a prophet sent to people, not to send to exclusively to one particular people. Now, though he may end up talking to one particular people because of circumstances, but not because he deliberately excluded others. He wouldn't do that. And that is the Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of all peoples of the Quran. And look at that. Say to him, would you purify your, yourself and let me guide you to your Lord so, so you would fear him. Look at the interest. He's going there. The mission isn't only to take the Israelites out of Egypt and that's that. No, he had to give Pharaoh a chance. He had to give him a chance to accept his message like he does to all people. Mm -hmm. And that is a manifestation, true manifestation of the term Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of all peoples, or as some translate, all of the world. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, 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 I wanted to add, just end with this, this kind of simple comparison that is, is a hard theological, but it has a dimensional, historical dimension as well. Because think about it, Paul, which one is more likely to be the historical um, kind of dialogue or the words that Moses said to Pharaoh? Which one is more aligned with the concept of God, even in the Bible, even though it has kind of this ethnocentric God, who is still at the same time, by the way, the God of everybody and everyone? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just, uh, that was the last slide. Um, and I would just finish with a couple of words um, here. Now, you know, we have discussed a number of um, kind of views, interpretations, where some people may not necessarily agree with everybody, everything I said. And I'm talking specifically about um, uh, our Jewish and Christian friends. They might look at that and they try to find a way of dismissing some of it, at least. The question is not really whether everything we said here is correct or not, because that at the end of the day is ishtihad, a form of personal reasoning. And we are all obviously subject to making mistakes. That's not really the main point. The main point is, it's about comparison, a rel relative significance, reliability. So even if somebody would disagree with something here, if they are of Christian or Jewish background, they should actually compare the two and see which one is more likely to be speaking history than the other, even if they think one of none of them is completely historical. Even if they say that there's only still that particular point to consider. And I'm sorry it took this long, Paul. No, no, that, that's great. I, I like your final theological point. Um, it, it really makes the the point that often the uh, the God portrayed in the Jewish scriptures uh, it, it is does seem very tribal, uh, a God amongst other gods who does battle and commits genocides and so on. Uh, unfortunately, that's often narrated. But the God of the Quran is very different. He's a God of all peoples, including the Egyptians, including Pharaoh, uh, and and the invitation is to to follow him. So it's a much more universal uh, universal understanding of God, which in today's world as well, is much more um, readily understood, I think, as we're aware of the global village and that we all inhabit the same planet. And that conception of God is much more naturally 
uh, understood by the plurality of our nations than one that is just uh, 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 sent to one particular group of people. It's, it's, I, think it, I think it was in the same book I mentioned earlier on the Exodus, quarter of a century ago, we introduced a concept, I don't know, it might have already been around or not, uh, we call it Israelization of religion. Hmm. It's like it's, it take, it, it, they took religion and the author of the Bible turned it into something ethnocentric is about Israel, Israel being yeah. at the heart, the people of Israel at the heart of it. Now, this creates a lot of problems for uh, the understanding continuity of the message of God. If God is the God of all people, if God is the same and the non-changing God from the beginning to end, which we all accept, Jews, Christians, um, Muslims, of course, then there's actually a, a problem. In the same way, we have this discontinuity problem when you look at suddenly Jesus appearing and becoming, now we have to deal with another form of divinity kind of uh, deity here in Christianity. Whereas if you go back, so what happened before Abraham, when we had Noah, when we had Adam, we, what, what was the religion of these people? What had this to do with Israel? Israel had not been even created. The background to all of this, what also at times people, I think I might mention this quickly, Paul, the concept of Israel, the Israelites, being a preferred people of God, it actually does exist in the Quran, but it's highly misunderstood. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does remind the Israelites of how he preferred them mm -hmm. uh, over other people. But really, the point here isn't he preferred them as an ethnic kind of um, group. And the preferring them wasn't, did not mean that your blood is actually more blue than the blood of other people. That isn't what he said. What he meant is that I sent you so many prophets like I haven't done with anyone else. I have given you this much because that is huge favor. Theologically speaking, from the point of view of Allah, from God, that's a huge favor. And what's interesting, in one um, verse where um, Moses is kind of angry with his people, he was reminding them, I don't know whether I have it somewhere in my notes or not, I don't have it, but basically uh, he, he told them that um, arguing with his people, جَعَلَ فِيكُمْ He made in you prophets, and he made you kings. And I think it goes on, and he gave you what he hasn't given to anyone else. Now, not the difference between the first two expressions, really, really, that's, you love the Quran with this kind of precision. He made among you prophets, not how the prophets are treated as a group that effectively doesn't belong there. They were sent because their main identity is messengers, messengers and the prophet, not Israelites. No, that's their main identity. When he follows with the, with the kingship, then he says, and he made you kings. They're talking now in the collective right. as you became kings. So uh, the, what, the difference, the distinction between these two is quite subtle but significant. Mm. In the same way, because the prophet's Messengers are not the product of their people. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not an, a, a product of the Arabic society at the time. He, he, he was above from outside. He's revolutionary. He was obviously was born there. He lived. He was an Arab in that sense. But as a prophet, as a messenger, he was actually it, it came from elsewhere, from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It had nothing to do with the environment. It's revolutionary. Mm -hmm. That applies not only to the Prophet sallam, it applied to Moses, who had to fight even at times polytheism among the Jews. Sorry, Paul, I think that went a bit... No, that, thank, thank you for that. And just to remind... Um, uh, everyone, the, the, the title of the talk originally was The Miraculous Quran and the Exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. So it's up to us individually to decide if there are these miraculous properties in the Quran. Um, there certainly seem to be some strong arguments for uh, that belief. 
but it's obviously up to us individually to decide if we find them convincing or not. But um, just to thank you very much, Dr. Louis uh, Fatui, for your time, your expertise, your incredible research and labours for on this and many other subjects over the years and many published works, uh, which people can simply Google your name, obviously, and find them sold on Amazon and other platforms as well. Um, so, yep, just thank you again for your time and um, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you for next time.